Thank you, Peter. So um, I think uh, you raised some questions. So that you think there are patients that um, that can be treated with only induction treatment with courses of bedesonide without maintenance treatment? Is that, that your statement? Yes, I think there is a certain subset of Crohn's disease patients which you can treat based on symptoms with repeated courses of bedesonide without starting maintenance treatments. For example, the first patient we had that long-term information of an uncomplicated disease course. This patient probably does not benefit from a maintenance therapy. So what proportion of patients with iliocolonic Crohn's disease would that be, you think? I think it's, it would be about 30% of the patients. Elsha, what is your take on that? So I agree that there is, that there is going to be a group of patients who does not need maintenance therapy. As long as they know they've got Crohn's, they know that they need to be monitored in some sort of way. The occasional course of budesonide. Occasionally we would use polymeric diet as another induction agent, as another possible strategy, and stopping smoking if they're, if they're smokers. Yeah. Uh, but there is that cohort that I think as long as they uh, know they've got Crohn's, the worst thing again is if they think you're not worried, so they go off and don't worry about it, and they're the ones who come back five years later with a great big mass. Because, so as yeah. long as they are under a system of having a cal protecting to, to monitor them or some strategy, then it keeps them keeps them. Would involved. that include patients that have deep ulcerations in the terminal ileum, or would that need to be restricted to like after ulcers? I think this is more the after ulcers patients. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Because sometimes you're really taken by surprise that the patients are you think they're okay, and all of a sudden they have a perianal abscess. Yep. That's a quite common situation. Yep. Right. So, Peter, if the disease is too active for pedesonide, should we go straight to immunomodulators with or without anti-TNF, or would you sure first um, do a course of prednisone? What, what, what would you recommend? I think when, when the disease does not respond to pedesonide, um, that I, I would first go for conventional steroids, but I would probably start maintenance therapy okay. at the same time. So what would that be then? As a tyoprin, so you probably. would go to prednisone as a tyoprin. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's. If a patient has iliocolonic Crohn's disease, I'm going to wake you up again. If a patient has iliocolonic Crohn's disease and does not respond to a course of bedesonide, who would go to prednisone and a tyopurin, or who would go to an anti-TNF? And prednisone tyopurin is red, and an anti-TNF is white. So I'll show. You Okay, so the vast majority is for prednisone and atiopurin. You're being followed. Okay. Let's see if there are quest other questions. Please come to the, to the microphone. There's another question for Elsha in the meantime that we forgot to deal with. What's the maximum dose of oral 5-ASA that you would ever give short and long term in a, to a patient? So I think 4.8 orally, but I would add in topical in addition. I think the dose of topical is a bit more interesting. Um, Again, one of the rules I say to patients is if it comes straight out again, it's doing no good down the pan, you can put another one in. So, you know, the suppository or the enema has got to stay in for a certain length of time before it uh, does any good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I find GPs get a bit worried if you're giving them 4.8 grams orally and they're having some topical therapy. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know your thoughts on that. Yeah, and the pharmacist I would call you. You're giving more than 8 grams yeah. 5 years into this patient. Do you have any thoughts on that? When you combine oral and rectal. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I see no concern. I, I don't think there is dose associated toxicity with 5ASA. All the toxicity is idiosyncratic and it's dose independent. But how high can you go? Evidently, it has a cost and a compliance problem. So, Peter, you showed data on bedesonide also in um, microscopic or collagenous colitis, where it's, you know, probably the only drug that we know that works. So, there typically we do not have maintenance treatment. Or would you there continue? also bedesonide long term, and would you use the ileal release formulation and to court that is, you know, the most widely available? So um, I think there is certainly a subset of patients with mi microscopic colitis that need maintenance therapy because it are those patients in which you start an induction regimen that respond very well and then you you um, taper down the corticosteroids and they relapse. So I think those patients, they are in need of a, of a long-term maintenance therapy, which according to the study can be up to one year. And uh, it, the, the study also showed that it had, um, uh, it improved quality of life of those patients, even if they had cutaneous symptoms. Um, is there a place for antocords? I Yes, I think so. Uh, 
who I have used it in the past, and it's and it works. works. It works quite well. Okay. 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 The nice thing about microscopic colitis and collagenous colitis is that usually a self-limited disease. After a couple of years, it disappears for some reason that we don't uh, understand. But I want to to make the bridge from microscopic collagenous to ulcerative colitis. Do you think there's a place for pedesonite in ulcerative colitis? That's one of the questions from the audience. So I think some of these are newer steroids, yes, I do think there's a place. I don't think we quite know what we're doing with them yet, whether um, it's uh, adding on to a 5-SA, whether it is, you know, what stage What are you exactly? meaning by new steroids? So budesonide, MMX. They're, um, all, they're, all, they're also budesonide. Yes, yes. But they're new release formulations. Exactly. Uh, uh, um, so, I mean, I think they do have a place, and I think may, it might well be that intercurrent use of short course of some of these are exactly the right strategy for some patients if their disease is behaving in that, in that sort of okay way, as long as, again, they're being monitored patients. Okay. Peter, you agree with that? No? Yeah, okay. I fully agree. Okay. There's a question, please. Speak in the microphone. We don't hear it well. So I think the technician fell asleep or something. So it's about CR. Yeah, so I think the, the first question. question was about 5-SA and chemo prevention. Um, so uh, yes, I, I, I do advocate uh, 5-SA drugs for chemo prevention um, because I think generally for ulcerative colitis, having good disease control uh, is, is right. I think it's slightly more difficult to know what to do if these patients are on, for example, thiopurines and anti-TNFs. Has 5-SA got added benefit in that scenario, yes or no? It might be that 5-SA is doing something very specific to the inflammation cancer pathway. I think that's an open question. I think what we do know so far is good disease control is probably going to be important. We presented some data this morning from St. Mark's implying that it's the chronicity of disease, which is particularly the risk factor for dysplasia. So controlling disease in the chronic way, whether it be with 5-SA or other drugs, is important. But I don't know the answer to whether 5-SA has got something additional to do regarding the mechanism of action. Yeah. It's a common question when you give newer drugs or add drugs to 5-SA. Do you need to continue the 5-SA? Yeah. So we we yeah, yeah. don't have an, an answer in, to that. In what doses? Sorry? In what doses? If you use another drug to maintain remission, but you still need 5-SA for... CRC. What dose would you maintain in addition to other drugs? What are, what are you guys doing? Well, I, I think anything about the, so the two mark, anything over about 1.6 grams a day is okay mm. for, for that yeah. sort of scenario. Yeah. So if, if you've got a really well-maintained patient, and exactly as we had the conversation earlier, they're okay, yeah. anything about the 1.6 mark, I think we really don't know if patients are also on thiopurines and anti-TNFs, yeah. what sort of dose. Yeah, a lot of those patients on much bigger doses, because by default they've kind of got to those bigger doses because they are less well patients. Yeah, 1.6 grams a day is the circumstantial evidence that we have, and the good news is that Tillots is developing a pill that has 1.6 gram of 5 a in one tablet, so that is quite attractive. Last question. Um, in patients who are young, diabetic, are you having any concerns with low EGFR? Would you commence them on high dose when they have flare-up or newly diagnosed UC? Uh, or would you consider alternatives in such patients because that's something to watch for and they're on <laughs> metformin and all that kind of things, actually? So, sorry, I didn't completely hear the question. No, I didn't. Can you speak in the microphone? Yeah. Uh, in patients who are young diabetics, do you have any concerns about high dose 5 ASAs in the long term maintenance? And if they have low EGFR, would you consider alternatives instead? Or okay. So I think mo monitoring the renal function is important. Um, again, you're probably aware of the data that Tarek Ahmed presented about nephrotoxicity with 5 ASA. It is something we are we do need to be very cognizant of. These patients do need to have renal function checked at least six monthly. That's the, certainly the guidelines from the, the British Society of Gastroenterology. Yep. And you can even get problems with topical 5 ASA. We had some patients in that cohort who'd only had topical 5 ASA, and that was the only reason why they had their, their nephrotoxicity. So monitoring is important. In a diabetic patient, yes, I think as long as it is being monitored, then at least that's, um, that's the right thing to be doing. But so I don't even think if, Even if they have a low EGFR, like 30 to start off with, would you commence? No, I think that's, that's, that's more difficult. I think I'd be, uh, yeah, I think I'd be thinking of alternatives. Yeah. 
but, and there is no evidence that there is dose dependency with nephrotoxicity with uh, bit 5 asa mm -hmm. so anyway i uh, wish to thank you for your active contribution professor elsa hart from london professor P hendrix from ghent and i hope you have a wonderful evening tonight in <laughs> amsterdam see you all tomorrow